Hello and welcome to our May 3rd Thursday. Our topic this evening is the great outdoors, bringing the natural world into your writing. I want to thank everybody who is tuning in to watch us both on our, on our webinar, webinar here on Zoom, but then also live on YouTube. We're so glad that you're with us and that you could spend some time with us this evening. My name is Becca Oliver. I'm the executive director of the Writers League of Texas. If you're not familiar with us, if this is your first time joining us for one of our programs, we are the largest literary arts organization in Texas, and we exist to support writers. So from just getting started to publishing their 10th book and anywhere in between, we have something in our programs or services um, that is going to support them along the way. So for sure, check out our website if you're not familiar with us. But every month, we love to do this event. We were doing it previously from, we've done it since the beginning of our organization, 40 years. Every third Thursday of the month for 40 years, we've been getting together and having conversations with writers about topics that are of interest to them, um, craft, the business of writing, what have you. And since March of 2020, we've been doing these virtually. Um, and it's just been a real wonderful experience to be able to bring this into the online space. So. Every month, it's a different topic. Tonight, of course, the great outdoors. And I'm so excited to be here moderating this conversation. So let's get to it. We're going to introduce our three panelists, and then uh, we'll jump into the conversation. Matt Bell is our first panelist. His next novel, Appleseed, is forthcoming from Custom House in July 2021. His craft book, Refuse to be Done, a guide to novel writing, rewriting, and revision, will follow in early 2022 from Soho Press. He's also the author of the novel Scrapper and a novel that has one of my favorite titles ever, In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, <laughs> as well as the short story collection, A Tree or a Person or a Wall, a nonfiction book about the classic video game Baldur's Gate 2, and several other titles. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Tin House, Conjunctions, Fairy Tale Review, American Short Fiction, and many other publications. A native of Michigan, he teaches creative writing at Arizona State University. So please give it up in the chat virtually. Um, thanks for being here, Matt Bell. <laughs> Our next panelist, David Marquis, is a writer and activist who lives in Dallas, Texas. Throughout his career, he has worked to create lasting positive social change in the environment, education, and human rights. Raised in West Texas during the drought of the 1950s, he has an abiding interest in water and conservation issues. Coming from a family of storytellers, he has written and performed multiple one-person stage shows, including I Am a Teacher, which toured for almost 20 years. His new book, The River Always Wins, is published by Deep Vellum Publishing. He dedicates his environmental work and advocacy to his three grandchildren that he might leave the world a better place for them and for future generations. I will happily applaud that and say thank you for being here, David. My pleasure. Julie Poole was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. She received a BA from Columbia University and an MFA in poetry from the University of Texas at Austin. In 2017, she was a finalist for the Keene Prize for Literature. Her first book of poems, Bright Specimen, was inspired by the Billy L. Turner Plant Resources Center at UT Austin and was published by Deep Vellum on May 4th and again on June 1st. <laughs> she has received fellowship support from the James A. Michener Center and participated in residencies at 100 West, the Helene Wurlitzer Foundation, and Yaddo. Her poems and essays have appeared in Cut Bank, Denver Quarterly, Poet Lore, Cold Mountain Review, Huff Post, and elsewhere. She lives in Austin with her growing collection of found butterflies, which she was kind enough to send us a photo of, and you can see there on the screen. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much, Becca. Happy to be here. And I also want to say what a great, you know, shout out to Deep Vellum Publishing, who are uh, great friends of ours and an amazing publisher based in Dallas, Texas. They do so many wonderful books of so many varieties, but they publish both David and Julie's book, which I think is wonderful. Um, and then also I'm going to give a shout out to Kirby Kim, one of my favorite people who is an amazing literary agent who when he heard the topic of this panel said, you have to meet my client, Matt Bell, because Matt Bell would be perfect. And he was right. So, <laughs> yay. 
So what a big topic, right? For the limited amount of time that we have this evening. Um, but I can't think of three better writers or three better books to approach this conversation with because each of your books we'll be talking about tonight are very different. And I have some specific questions for each of you, but I think um, as, a, as a grouping, they're also just gonna give us so much rich and wonderful um, uh, perspective on this topic. So first though, I wanna start with a more general question, personal question, but also general. So we can give the folks watching a sense of who you each are as writers as it relates to this topic. So I'd love to hear a bit about your connection with the wild world outside of our doors. And I kind of hinted at this with the folks in the chat box a little while ago, but could each of you tell us about one place or one memory you have that maybe represents your connection with the natural world? A favorite park, a bird song, a flower. I hope this doesn't sound silly, but I just really wanted to start the panel with a personal shout out to this, um, to this topic and to get an idea of who you are through hearing about a favorite slice of the natural world. So I'm gonna start in alphabetical order for this first one. Matt Bell, what do you got? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Becca. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I, I think I'll start by talking about Michigan because I'm there visiting right now, which is where I grew up and, and write about so much. But uh, I spent a lot of time hiking and backpacking outdoors. And I, I grew up in rural Michigan. Uh, but two of my favorite places in Michigan are, are the Sleeping Bear Dunes on the west side of the state where my family spent a lot of time in that area. And that mean a lot to me, sort of, I think, emotionally and imaginatively. And then the uh, Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore in the UP. Um, I go backpacking there with my dad as often as I can. Every time we get back, he says, that's a bucket list thing, comes off, it goes right back on. You know, that's always something that's like one more time uh, while we can. I think that's a place that's really like near and dear uh, to our hearts. Thank you. I'm, Thanks, I'm adding them both to my list as well. Yes. Um, David, what about you? Over 20 years ago, my wife and I were lucky enough and stumbled into um, the opportunity to buy three and a half acres of land about 10 minutes from downtown Dallas and just down the street from the Oak Cliff Nature Preserve, which I founded in 1999. And uh, so every morning I get to go outside and walk this three and a half acres, which is full of possums and raccoons and foxes and, of course, all kinds of squirrels and bird life and a lot of trees. And there's a big live oak out back where I go and we have a conversation in the mornings. Hmm. And I stand and talk to that tree and listen to that tree. Um, the only time I take technology to nature is when I take my phone. And on my phone, I don't have any selfies. But I have hundreds of pictures of nature right here close at hand. So I know where to look where the leaves are gonna be blowing and the gentle breeze or where the native grasses will be blowing or where we might have some, uh, some native trees blossoming in different, different times of the year. So for me, it's very close at hand. And there are special places in the world to me also. The tip of South Africa, where I went at one time, the place where the Mississippi and the Missouri River come together. So there are many, many places that are special to me. But every morning, I'm blessed with the opportunity to walk outside and walk into um, a nature preserve where we live that we literally stumbled into. and. Um, where it's home, it's our corner of the universe. We're both West Texans, so we'd always want to have some land. And the fact that it's only 10 minutes from downtown makes it even more special. That's awesome, thank you. Julie, how about you? Well, I live in central Austin, so, um, you know, there's lots of you know, busy traffic and I don't actually own a car and I don't have a bike. <laughs> So I walk everywhere and um, I found like my saving grace has been the Shoal Creek hike and bike trail that I would walk every day to get to work or just get anywhere. And that, that trail is just so special to me because it gets me off the main streets and I can get behind this rock wall and be exposed to a pond with uh, turtles just chilling out, swimming around. And for me, that daily experience, it, it's so short. It's, I, it's like a mile and a half to my, uh, usually in, in my walking range. 
but it clears my head and it's just been a lifesaver for me to have that trail um, mm. and the sound of water. And so I try to make the most of um, nature like in an urban environment um, because that's what I have to work with right now. <laughs> But probably the most formative element for me is the Pacific Ocean. Um, I grew up in the Northwest. And to me, like the sound of the ocean, the way it kind of just obliterates every thought mm. that I might want to have. <laughs> and makes me feel so small, but also connected to um, a sense of geological time. Um, I think that that has shaped me as a person. So I, I seek out water uh, it, it, here in Texas, <laughs> which, yeah. can be, which can be hard. Yeah, Just that dovetails perfectly when we start talking about David's book, for sure. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, the Shoal Creek Trail right there and that sort of space where you realize, oh, I'm still in Austin, but I don't feel like I'm in Austin right now. Mm. It's cool. Thank you, each of you. That was really a great reminder, I think, of how much we have around us and, and that, you know, ideally we're taking advantage of it and getting outside of our, our interior spaces and communing a little bit with nature. So... It seems like when we talk about writing about the natural world, that whether it's fiction or nonfiction, many works, and this is really simplistic, so please, I know, but fall into one of three categories, sometimes all three. Writing about climate change and the ways that uh, man has endangered the natural world, writing that celebrates the natural world and the beauty of the natural world, and then writing that uses the natural world as a metaphor for something else. So I'm going to start tonight, because your books are so different, I'm going to go one by one with some questions for each of you, and then we're going to also have the opportunity to have some questions for, for the whole group. But I will say that, please, you know, I want this to be a conversation. So if there is something that you want to interject at some point, I'm all for it. But Matt, I'm going to start with you. So your novel, Appleseed, which publishes in July and which I have been lucky enough to read and, and so love, um, it's a big book in so many ways, right? So it starts in the 1700s in rural Ohio. It jumps to 50 years in the future from today um, to a climate change ravaged America. And then it jumps a thousand years into the future to basically another ice age. Um, and probably my favorite character, who is this sentient being named C433. Um, I love this quote from Jess Walt Water, Walter that says, you may well have invented the pulse pounding novel of ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to Kirby earlier, it's so true because you usually think, okay, I guess I'll read this novel about ideas. <laughs> It'll make me a better person. But this book is a page turner as well. And, and um, my question for you is this, where do you even begin? What came first in this story? And was this always going to be a novel of ideas or did it start as something entirely different? Yeah, thanks so much, Becca. I really appreciate that. And thank you for like uh, describing it so uh, concisely. I feel like every time I try to describe this novel, it takes me three hours. So thank you for doing <laughs> that. Um, uh, you know, I, I started with the, the storylines in the 1700s. The novel is called Appleseed and is in part a retelling of Johnny Appleseed um, as if he was a half human, half animal fawn from Greek mythology, which is actually really the starting point. That idea I was out for a run. I was listening to uh, Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire on my uh, headphones. I was running. And there's a part in that where he talks with the apple and he talks about Johnny Appleseed, who was, who was a folklore character I was always really obsessed with when I was a kid. And he starts talking about it as a Dionysian figure. And I just had this sort of, uh, well, wouldn't it be funny to write about Johnny Appleseed as like a literal Dionysian figure? And, uh, and then four years later, the book was done. And, you know, it's just that that easy. Um, but it was such a nice entry point to have this sort of character who was at home, neither in, in nature or sort of in the human world, um, which I think is, 
I don't know, a way a lot of us feel in a lot of different ways or, or we modulate between those things, the way we sort of go to nature to feel like ourselves or the way we're feel like we're not ourselves in urban places sometimes. And, you know, even J Julie was just talking about that way you like slip out of the city into the natural. And I feel that in Phoenix, certainly, um, which is which is really easy to do here too. And so it really kind of started from that and it gave me access to a lot of other ideas that very quickly became sort of that big time scale. Um, uh, cause I wanted to, I don't know, climate change isn't centralized in one time or, or location. Right. And so I'm looking for those ways, but it really began from that really simple kind of funny idea about like, what if I wrote this weird Johnny Appleseed story? Um, and then sort of spiraled out from there, uh, fantastically. So yeah. So the point of entry was really just that. Well, and, and this question is also for you. So there are these few pages in the novel because it, as I was reading it, well, so there are a few pages in the novel where we're with my buddy, um, C433, mm -hmm. when he finds a binder and it's labeled Greater Ohio Regional Respeciation Build Inventory. Yeah. And then you have several pages that follow, like several pages, guys. Yes, um, a lot. <laughs> where you just list the names of animals. Or as C433 thinks of them, the unimaginable beasts who once inhabited this Ohio. So it starts with the American badger, and it's truly just a list of animals. And it was surprisingly emotional for me reading those pages, and especially because I, I forced myself to read every name. And sometimes uh. with lists like that, you skip past. And a part of me wondered, is this, are these five pages what this book is even here for? Is this, did Matt Bell want us to scream, you know, the names of these animals and make us all remember them um, even before they're no longer with us? So as a, as a writer, what did those pages mean to you? And what did that list mean to you? Oh, thank you so much for asking about those. And, and thank you for the way you read them. I feel like writers love lists. The list is such a fun thing to make. And then I do think readers skim them a lot. So thank you so much for, for staying in there on it. Um, I, I think it, exactly what you, what you said, you know, um, I was writing the book between 2016 and, and I guess, you know, like about a year ago when I finished editing it. Um, and though, when I wrote that passage, those were all of the animals that were alive in Ohio at the time I wrote the book. And when C43 reads them, they no longer exist. You know, so it's this, this just elegy of the sort of natural world. Um, there's an art, art, a performance art piece, really, but it also has a physical thing called Species Wall that I uh, came to ASU while I was there that I saw, which is this marathon reading of like all of the endangered species that exist on, on Earth. And I think that sort of inspired that passage. It's very powerful. You really can't stay for the whole thing unless you're up for like 20 hours of that, right? So like you sort of, you dip in and out of it. And like, even your unwillingness to stay for all of it is almost part of the art performance, right? Um, someone who skips that list gets something different than someone who reads all of it. But I think it is really powerful just to hear those names and the, the 17 kinds of newts or something, right? That you get, you can't even like imagine how they're different from each other in your brain. Um, but to, to hear that, that was the one thing that was my litmus test, I think, for the book. I thought an editor would be like, oh, this book's great. But let's take out that five page list of animals in the middle of the book that you don't explain. Um, and my, my agent Kirby's in the audience. Kirby didn't ask me about it or bother me about it. My agent was <laughs> like, I like this a lot. It's sort of like our editor was like, I like this. Uh, one of my blurbers told me that that list made them cry while they're reading the book. I mean, like, it's interesting. It is like an emotional part of the book. Um, that is probably the move you're not supposed to try in the middle of a page turning book, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it, I think it is a, a sort of heart of it. Um, that's the the stark inventory of what will be lost, right? Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm so glad it connected with you that way. Um, that's uh, the ideal, the ideal reader. So thank you so much, Vic. Thank you for calling me the ideal reader. Um, so David, <laughs> uh, we're gonna move to your wonderful book, The River Always Runs. I don't have a, a copy of your book, Matt, to hold up, but I'm gonna hold up David's um, book here. So this is actually, oh, <laughs> good job. Um, this is a small book in length, but a big book in what it sets out to do and what it does, what it accomplishes. And I love this passage, I hope you, I hope, writers don't cringe too much when no, moderators read their own words to them. This is just a tiny um, passage from The Headwaters. 
It is the headwaters of movement for all activity on the earth is tied to the movement of water, of tides, of rivers and rainfall, of drinking water moving through pipes, of crops and hydropower, of wild animals on the Serengeti migrating to watering holes and that movement, the movement of water is tied to gravity and slope and the moon and the moon to the earth and the earth to the sun and to the far reaches of the universe. I love that. Um, Thank you. This book celebrates the natural world. It celebrates the connections all of nature has with each other, but it also uses water as a metaphor for hope in troubled times, right? Um, so metaphor is a mighty tool in a writer's toolkit. Um, it can be unwieldy and it, you know, it needs a steady hand. And in this case, in your book, your hand is so steady and you hit the mark straight on with what you're doing here. And I believe Ron, Ron Charles of the Washington Post said, I'm usually allergic to modern works of inspiration, but there's something calming about Marquise's aphorisms on the persistent, irresistible force of water. Um, so where did this link for you come from? Where did this link between water and social change spark? And how did you set about crafting what is really a lyrical essay, right? Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you and thank you for picking that particular passage about water and how it's tied to the far sides of the universe. Um, in 1993, my wife, the lovely Diane and I were in Taos, New Mexico. We have family in New Mexico and um, there's a river gorge there. And the Rio Grande comes down through the mountains and there's a bridge over that gorge. And I went and stood and looked down into that gorge and saw the river there at the bottom of the gorge. And a couple standing nearby um, were looking down also. And one of them said, gee, how did that river get that far down in that gorge? And of course it got there because the river cut its way there over thousands of years. That's how that river got there. Through the daily work of persisting and continuing to move towards what I call the greater water, the ocean. So at that moment in time, I knew somehow that someday I would write about that. And I knew I would write about water because I grew up in Lubbock during the drought of the 1950s. My family, my late aunt, uncle, grandmother, uh, my mother, they all grew up during the Dust Bowl. They remembered Black Sunday when the sky turned black with dust. And when I grew up in Lubbock in the 50s, we used to walk home from school backwards, bent over, because you couldn't take that sand in the face and in your eyes and in your mouth and down your lungs. So we walked home from school backwards against the dust storms from the 1950s. So water has always been really important to me, extremely important to me. And I've also been involved in social justice movements since I was about 15 years old. So to me, watching us as a culture, as a world, not just as the United States, but as a world, continue to move toward justice, and equity and equality. It's like watching a river move forward. And the through line of the book is that if enough drops flow together in the same direction long enough, the river always wins. And I really believe that, that that's how we have to live with that desire to make it together all the way through to a better space and a better place. And when I began to see that, I began to realize what an important part uh, in my life, water has always played. I went once to the spot in Missouri where the Missouri River and the Mississippi come together to watch those two great rivers converge. When I was in Africa, I went to the southern tip of Africa to watch those two great oceans come together. So I've always had this great desire to be close to water. And because I've always been close to social justice, those two began to come together for me. And I spent about um, five years unwriting the book the first couple of drafts had a lot of things in them. And I came to realize a lot of this has to go. And Will Evans, great publisher at Deep Bell, encouraged me to continue with the lyrical piece of it. And so it became a lyric essay. It really goes back to a very, very deep place within me of coming from a family that knew drought and a place that knew drought and having a great value for a simple glass of water. And now I'm working um, as an advocate and activist on building a water gardens and urban wetlands in, near downtown Dallas. 
that will filter 2 billion gallons of storm water a year. Wow. Because I really believe the future of water is filtration. So we're doing a great deal of work nationally and, and here in the house area also on water issues as an activist. But um, for me, uh, the river must always win because that is, um, as, as in, says in chapter one, rivers ancient as days may differ in the life along their banks, the depth of the frequency of their flooding. But one thing is true, if enough drops flow together in the same direction long enough, the river always wins. Mm. There was a time in this country where women were not even allowed to vote, but the river won. There was a time when black people were enslaved because of the color of skin, but the river won. So that's how I look at the river as the metaphor for progress. Well, and the river has still, you know, far to continue flowing. Long way to go. A lot of ways to go. I yep. Another quote from your book, God bless drought, without it, we would all die of thirst. Um, and I did want to take a moment. You mentioned growing up in West Texas. You are the, the only Texan born and bred on this um, on this panel, and we are the writers of your Texas. So I'd be remiss not to just ask you, you touched on it, but is there anything else about that, um, that, that growing up in West Texas that shaped you as a writer? Well, the sense of story. You know, I come from a family of storytellers. That's what you did in West Texas. You pushed back the dinner table and listened to the stories from the depression, of World War II, and, and, um, you know, you look at the great musicians, Buddy Holly and um, the Chicks and more blues artists than I can name. It's a great sense of narrative coming from there. Mm -hmm. And I think that narrative comes often from our being close to the land and also appreciating scarcity. Um, you know, you mentioned chapter eight about the drought. You have to learn the art of defiance. You're living through a drought, you have to have hope, but you also have to be able to defy it and stick it out and be tough. And there's something about that land. You know, if a hailstorm comes in May and hails out your cotton crop, you just have to replant. You just have to go again. And so there's a certain toughness that comes from that also, from living in that space. And, and that, uh, I think that, that that helps us as writers mm -hmm. is to know you're not going to get it in the first draft. You're not going to get it in the second draft. You're going to have to persist the same way you have to persist in difficult times and difficult circumstances. Yeah, no, that's so true. I was thinking persist in the drafting, persist in the publishing part of it. All of it feels like, you know, you've got to be ready to try and try again. And I think that's a great way of, um, of putting it. Thank you. So Julie, I love this collection. Um, bright specimen. So, and I know where it began, or I at least know what inspired it, right? And we mentioned this in your bio, um, the Billy L. Turner Plant Research Center at UT Austin, the largest herbarium in the Southwestern US. So you talk in the afterward about your time spent with the flowers there and how, as you put it, in a way, it felt like I was learning how to read, not words, but natural forms. So I, I love the, I love the poems, but I, I also love the afterword, by the way. <laughs> so you also say in your afterword that you first began to write about the specimens you thought your main interest when you first started writing was going to be the beauty of these specimens. But that, as you said, gradually, I realized I wasn't interested in beauty at all. I was trying in a cer certain sense to heal myself from certain traumas I'd experienced in my life. What began as a meditation on beauty became a meditation on healing from violence. So I imagine a lot of writers who are listening understand that link, have found that link themselves at times between writing and healing. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that, where and how you made that connection between the specimen on the table in front of you and your own life experiences and how that realization changed the way that you approached the collection. Um, your observations of the flowers and how this uh, how this book unfolded. Oh wow! Um, so I think to start with, I've always been influenced by the work of um, the art historian and critic, and also painter John Berger. He wrote a book 
uh, on ways of seeing, I believe. And it was really influential for me as a poet because it talks about really looking at something and, and really seeing it and taking the time to describe it. And when I graduated uh, with an MFA, I, I was wondering if I really knew how to, to, just, to describe anything. <laughs> And if I could like describe what I was seeing and I learned that it's incredibly difficult to put language to um, just anything, any object before you and have it convey like the true essence of what that thing is. And that to me was the struggle and uh, the intrigue, and it forced me into a headspace of meditating on um, what these plants, um, not necessarily meant to me, but sort of uh, the life that was still within them that I could sense. And these are like pressed plants that are on paper. Some of them date back <laughs> to, uh, I found a few specimens that were located within the region where Thoreau was uh, doing work and collecting plants. And it was incredible to look at a plant that had come from the region that he was writing in and to think about the history of what a plant can represent. And um, I was deeply affected by that it also gave me a way to, in a way, block out the world that was I was really not able to cope with. I wasn't able to cope with post-election life. I wasn't able to cope with uh, flashbacks of violence that I had experienced as someone who has a mental illness and who has been hospitalized for a mental illness. And those things resurface in my life and I had no way of talking about them. So the way I talked about those experiences was through the vehicle of looking at something else. Um, and that's why these poems are deeply personal to me. <laughs> I didn't intend them to be narrative. They're not about me, but they're personal because they were, um, a way of healing something that I didn't quite know was that broken uh, until I started to experience what I now understand was probably PTSD from uh, experiences of having a mental illness in this country, which often responds with, uh, with uh, the use of force and, and violence. And so uh, it offered me an opportunity to be brave enough to talk about that. Um, these plants are like kind of <laughs> tethered or bound to the page. And that reminded me of, of situations where I myself had experienced that ex same sensation of uh, being in restraints um, at an ER. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me that that book led me to, this book led me to those realizations about how interconnected things are and how we can actually seek out, as David was mentioning, we could seek out water, we could seek out those things that fascinate us, um, has, a, has an obsession, but also something that is deeply embedded and ingrained in, in who we are as individuals. I want to thank you so much for, for that answer, because I think that there are probably a lot of folks listening who are finding that, especially that idea of using other objects before you and, and looking at those when you don't, when you're not necessarily able to look at uh, an experience in your own life, looking at those objects and finding your way into, you know, that process through the objects themselves that, um, I think is 
part of what you're talking about here. And that, that leads me to another line from your afterward, which really struck me, which was the only thing I'm certain of is this observing nature up close has provided a path forward, a means of healing, a way to imagine what sort of world we could live in. In plant and animal forms, I believe there are lessons of peace and unity. These lessons are available for us to decipher if we are willing to observe. And I think that speaks to all of your books um, in different ways. And so for each of you, I want to ask this question with the natural world as writers, we have to look closely, right? We have to call on all of our powers of observation for the writers listening this evening. Can you talk about ways that you approach that task, that task of observing, of observing the natural world? And I wanted to stick with you, Julie, because I also love the story you have of how you kind of came upon this research center and meeting George who said, you want a tour? And then basically you never left. <laughs> so your own, you know, and, and that you also, had, there's a moment where you mentioned that you expected to find, like you might actually find the most beautiful flower in the world there, mm. that that was possible. Um, yeah. There's so much, um, you know, there's just so much to the story of how you came upon it. I don't know if you'd want to talk about that a little bit. And then if there is something else you want to share about like truly just observing those flowers, how you started as a writer to even describe what you were looking at. Yeah, well, the herbarium is an incredible place. It's basically a library. Uh, I believe it's seven stories Mm-hmm. huge cabinets that are uh, seven feet tall and it's you pull out these shelves and there are plants from all over the world and close mm-hmm. to a million specimens mm-hmm. so it's it's like <laughs> it's just an incredible <laughs> place and I had no idea it existed until I turned in my thesis and took a wrong turn down a hallway and just opened a door and was like I don't know if I'm supposed to be in here. <laughs> but see what and uh, the curator and director uh, uh, just popped out of his office and welcomed me. And I was so shocked that he was so welcoming. <laughs> and I was, I asked him about, you know, uh, the plants and he showed me some specimens and uh, UT's herbarium holds a specimen that Darwin had collected. It was just mind blowing to me that this wealth of um, just knowledge, living knowledge uh, was present and I had never known about it. Mm-hmm. And I asked him if I could write uh, about some of the flowers and, and I don't think he knew what he was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I stayed for six months and then I came back periodically and my next book is actually unfortunately for him also tied to uh collections within the herbarium so he can't get rid of me <laughs> he was just you kidding me. you're like the greatest PR for that place ever <laughs> right. well, you know, the work of a botanist and the work of a poet, I think, have some sort of aligning um, overlap in that you could work in a field of research and science and just um, spend a decade working on a single species of plant. Mm-hmm. And who cares about that work? except for maybe your colleagues and people who are especially interested in that specific plant, but it has huge ramifications if that you know, plant goes extinct or is no longer found. And so it's like this constant um, like river forging work <laughs> through time where you will spend uh, just like so much time working on something that very few people will see and as a poet, I'm like, okay, I know my mom is going to read this. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not even all the way through. <laughs> my book. But with poets, it's so hard to find readers. And you feel so often that your work isn't going to be seen or valued. Or mm. you want to make a contribution, but that contribution doesn't seem to have 
rewards in a capitalist driven society. It's not gonna congratulate you. <laughs> I'm not gonna receive congratulations for, for writing poems. Um, unfortunately, you know, that's just how society looks at the work that artists do. And so I loved being able to sit at a desk and, and knowing that there were other people, botanists who were working and their work intensely working, you know, mm -hmm. 10 hours a day. And I was just like, wow, if I could devote that effort into my craft, then I might, um, I might have to make some major breakthroughs. Mm. <laughs> Discover that new species of yes. poem. That <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. That's awesome. So, so David, talking about observation and how you observe the natural world and then write about it, especially I, I would assume as an activist um, and as somebody who does a lot of amazing work on behalf of you know the natural world, that you do find yourself having to cite other people and probably describe this beauty that you're talking about in a way that is going to be compelling and unforgettable. How do you approach and what tips would you have for writers about when you set, set out to actually describe that river, describe that, that drop of water in a way that is going to be compelling? When you go into nature, I think you have to slow down. You have to pay attention. So often these days, people go outside to ride a bike really fast or to run really fast mm. or to hike, to go somewhere. And I say go outside and slow down. Pay attention. That's the best way to really let it get into you. There's a mountain in New Mexico that I love to climb called El Cielo. And the Vista from the top is breathtaking, but along the way, there's a small stream with wildflowers beside it. And over to the right, there's a grove of aspen rustling in the breeze. So if I get to the mountaintop, but I've missed the wildflowers from the stream and the aspens, what's the point of getting to the top? So you have to do those things in order to really take that in and to absorb it. One of the things I do every morning, my first ritual, when I get up is I open the blinds in the bedroom. Because if you think about it for a moment, you realize that based on the position of the earth to the sun, when the sky is clear or it's cloudy, the breeze moving the tree leaves back and forth across the window, the light coming in through the window and falling on the floor is never again going to be that light as it is in that moment. So you ask yourself, which makes you a better writer? To go and check your Instagram account? or to notice the light on the floor at that moment in time, because it's never gonna be that way again. So if you go into nature, slow down, pay attention, and take advantage of every moment that you can observe, and then write about it. And you don't have to write about it in any great metaphorical sense. You know, John Steinbeck, years after he won all his awards for the Grapes of Wrath and, and won the Nobel Prize for Literature was in Hollywood writing screenplays just to make money. And he wrote warm-ups every morning and then threw them away. <laughs> He'd look out the window of the fill office in the studio and write warm-ups and then pitch them in the, in the trash can. <laughs> and so Observe. He, yeah. Yeah, pay attention and then write it down. I love it. Thank you. We've got people in the chat box saying yes. <laughs> um, Matt, do you have any tips you want to add about obs observation and tips for writers on how to really um, capture anything additional? And yeah, maybe I'll just say, you know, um, I mean, I loved everything Julie and David said. I, I could listen to Julie talk about the herbarium for the rest of my life, maybe. So I, I might just need an audiobook of this. Um, but, uh, but I think one of the, the things I think about a lot is like the way that learning the names of the first layer of nature lets you see the second layer, you know, um, and the layers beyond that. Uh, I'm not from the Southwest. I've always loved the Southwest. I tried to move to Arizona when I was 20 and failed miserably and ended up moving back here as a, as a professor in my 30s. And I just got lucky to end up in the Southwest that I love so much. Um, but when we first moved here, 
you know, like the seasons are not the seasons of Michigan, let's say. Um, they're a little a little less <laughs> obvious. And it took me a while to learn them. And we'd go out in the desert. I love hiking the desert. And um, I, uh, my wife is a birder and a master naturalist and, and love being at the, the slow pace of Dave is talking about. I'm also a, a trail runner and, you know, a, a different pace of long distances across the desert. And, uh, and it took a while to learn what we were looking at. And, you know, we learned the names of the obvious plants, the saguaro, the ocotillo, the, you know, um, uh, and then you see the next layer of plants once you learn that and you learn the obvious animals and you see the next layer. And the more you see, the more names you learn, the more you see. And as we have learned to like know what we're looking at, we keep seeing more and more layers. Um, and I think like that feels like part of writing a book too, because you you start getting into your topic and you start thinking about what you're thinking about um, and you start getting closer to the truth of it, more of it opens up to you. Um, I, uh, I think uh, mystery is really important to me in writing. And I think about mystery in the way I thought of it when I was, I was raised Catholic and the way I think about it in my Catholic upbringing uh, the mysteries of the faith get deeper as you go into them. They don't, they're not solvable. They open. And I think like learning to write about the natural world feels that way to me too. That's not a solvable or knowable mystery, but the more you know about it, the deeper the mystery gets and the deeper your involvement in it gets. And that really is some of the joy of, of writing about it. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up. I know other people have other questions, but you know, Becca was talking about like the scale of this novel and all these things about and the sort of plot and how it's a page turner. But the page turner in some way is in the service of like the parts where someone sits by a river in the book, you know, like it's it's almost like a, the trick is to get you to read the name of those animals or to get you to spend time with this tree that C43 cares for for much of the book. Um, the the page turner is in, in service of slowness. It, which is, I think, one of the qualities I most want in my own life and in thought and in feeling. So, yeah, I think there, there is sort of a relationship between those two things. And, um, yeah, the more I can name, the more I can see, and the more I want readers to feel and, and see in a similar way. Well, and sticking with you for a minute, Matt, because I want to talk about research a little bit. Yeah. And I'm specifically interested in your approach to research and how much or little you dove into the science of climate change, um, for example, as you were writing Appleseed, because for fiction, you know, we've talked about the page turner. You want the plot to move. You want folks to get lost in the story. You don't want them to get bogged down in the minutia of, is this really possible scientifically, right? But you also don't want to pull the readers out of the story because they're wondering, is this really possible scientifically? Right. <laughs> um, I think you did a really wonderful job of crafting both a believable and terrifying story about where this little rock of ours called Earth is going to, you know, where we're headed. Um, but without things getting bog bogged down. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the, a little bit about the research you did um, for a topic as big as this, and then, you know, how you found that balance. Yeah, uh, you do an incredible amount of research and then you use a tiny percent of it, right? You know, I mean, it's always this, you know. I think one of the things that was interesting about the book is, I mean, I partly wrote about climate change because obviously I'm terrified about climate change. Um, and I don't, writing about it and researching it didn't make me feel calmer, or didn't make me feel better necessarily, but it made me feel calmer. Like in the same way that when you know something's wrong with you and you don't go to the doctor, you feel awful. And then like you go to the doctor and, you know, maybe the diagnosis isn't great, but at least there's an answer. Um, and so I think the research was, was really great in that way. In a pure like writerly sort of way, I've, I found this recent trick. I, I, in the book I'm writing, the same thing is happening. It happened in Appleseed too, where I have to... I have to write a lot of exposition sometimes to figure out what the characters know or what I know, or what the book thinks. And then after like writing it all, there'll be this point where like the characters in other scenes are just speaking about it as if they've always known it. And then I cut all that exposition. It's like this weird, like figuring out the interior life of my characters by writing a lot. And then at some point, someone will just like remember something from an exposition. I'll be like, oh great, I can get rid of it all. That's not a thing the book knows. And so like it goes in and it comes out. Um, if I have any writing tip about this, it's uh, for me personally, I can't take like a bunch of notes from research. They become very sterile. Like if I read a nonfiction book and I write a bunch of notes, they become almost unusably like high school note cards for my research paper kind of notes. I can't use them. So my rule is if I'm reading a book uh, for research and something sparks my interest, I'm like, oh, that should go in the book. I make myself use it in a scene or use it in a paragraph or use it in a piece of dialogue. And that's the only way I let myself write it down so that research becomes generative 
as opposed to creating this separate body of work that I can't use. Um, I think that's been that's been a nice tactic for me is so that research feeds and pushes the writing as opposed to is, is sort of separate. Um, but that said, I, of course, read, you know, I don't know, hundreds of books to write this one. And that feels like the normal proportion, you know, yeah. and part of the fun, part of the reason to do it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you probably could spend five minutes just scaring the heck out of everybody who's listening right now with what yeah. <laughs> what would be the purpose of course and you know two years ago I could have given a lecture about the history of the domestication of the apple for like a gross amount of time that my wife probably had to listen to over the dinner table and I'm just like from its humble roots in Kazakhstan it would have been this whole thing but like it's better just to read the book and be like apples are wondrous you know oh, that's fine <laughs> Julie has a question yeah, Ooh, yeah Matt so um are you um are you finishing your research? Like you're not reading all those books and then diving in. Your no. writing has your researching. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but I think like um, I'm doing some early on where I'm trying to figure some stuff out, but I think the best research for me is often actually in the second draft when I'm like revising the book and I know what the book is interested in, or like I read a book of nonfiction about like geoengineering, which is part of the books about, and I know what the book's interest in geoengineering is, as opposed to just like geoengineering in general. And the facts that go in the book become very apparent or the book, you know, I'll be reading something like, ah, that's something this character would think about or, but on the first draft, I usually don't know that. So it's just stuff. Is it similar for you? I don't do research. Oh good, that's even better. <laughs> Poets. Oh, oh, no. oh. <laughs> you're looking. You're looking. That's research to look and to be careful and to have your own thoughts and your own feelings about a part of the world. That's better research than reading somebody well, else's thoughts of the world. I, I thought about research and I was originally was like, I'm going to learn everything I can about lavender and then I'll be able to write about lavender. And then I got totally crippled by that because right, I was right. like, well, how many books? Where do I cut myself off? Like, <laughs> how much do I really need to know? And then I realized that what I wanted to adopt was like, like almost a child's mind, yeah. a Zen philosophy of first thought, best thought. So I wasn't censoring myself as I was making the observations. Now, of course, I want to know everything about plants, plant systematics, and and like you know, get into the nitty gritty. But I think if I would have done that up front. I would have been hyper self-conscious in a way of trying to get things right when I'm not a botanist. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm coming from a different direction. Well, and it's interesting that you say that. First of all, I want to make it clear that I love poets and I have a lot of poet friends who are listening who uh, think I were coming for coming from them, but for them with the research um, comment. But what I actually in reading these poems, I, I was going to ask you that question because I did think you did research. You're so, you're so intimately, you know, familiar with these flowers that it surprises me to hear that you didn't. And I think that is part of going back to that idea of observation and just being able to, to see, but then also um, see below the surface, if that makes sense. So I, um, I'm, I'm glad you didn't do any research, Julie, because you, you nailed it. Um, anything you want to add about research, David, before we, we start taking some questions from the audience? I don't know what it's important, but it's a part of the whole. It's not anywhere close to the whole. Oh. Be aware of be aware the whole of that um, is more important than any particular piece of it. Let it inform you, but don't let it drive your writing. Yeah, I like that. Let it inform you, but don't let it drive your writing. It's great advice. Um, so go, so sticking with research for a second, because I, um, I did want to answer this question that came in. What tools, and Matt, Matt, maybe you could address this. What tools or methods do you use to store and organize that research? Do you have, I know you said you don't write it down, but so just really up here. 
Yeah, this, I mean, I definitely, uh, I have a crazy note on my phone of all the stuff, you know, that I'm finding and thinking as I go. I definitely dog ear and highlight books and keep them. I, I keep uh, the shelf close to my desk is always the research for the book I'm writing. And it just slowly fills up over the years of writing. I have a gross bookmark folder for every book full of just like everything I think could ever possibly be related to it. But I don't use something like Evernote or something like that. I just don't have those kind of notes for the, so far the kind of way I work. Um, so it's, it gets a little grab baggy. I save a lot of stuff I never look at again um, because I think it might be important. Almost like the saving it is the important part. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that rule where I like, write research into the book is, is really my main research method. I've done a lot of like in-person research for things. My, my last book was about metal scrapping and in, in, uh, uh, legal metal scrapping in downtown Detroit. And I did a lot of like in-person research for that in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, there's things that, uh, the Lamar Valley and Yellowstone is really important to this book, which was, a, you know, a place I've spent time and, and love. Uh, I hiked a glacier in Iceland and the glacier in this book is definitely informed by, by that kind of thing. Um, but I wasn't doing those things for the book necessarily. Those were like the things you're living that stick in your imagination and become like a source that continues to provide. Um, but yeah, I don't have like a really cool filing system I could share, unfortunately. Um, if only, if only. Well, and I think that, and someone pointed this out too, that, you know, whether we're talking about the work, you know, Julie's collection and the, you know, the research in itself of just immersing yourself in that collection yeah. and yes. going through specimen by specimen by specimen, you know, in the, for the natural world, for writing about the natural world, some of the best research we can do is get out and be yeah. in the natural world or spend time with this piece of nature, whatever it is that we're going to be writing about. So um, Matt, this is a question for you. I'm guessing you're familiar with Ursula Le Guin. If so, please tell us about her influence on your writing. Yeah, um, I uh, love Ursula Le Guin, uh, one of my favorite writers. Uh, I would say I, I had not read much Le Guin up to a point, and I, I have a, a project I give myself mostly every year where I try to read all of a like famous living American writers work kind of as much of it as I can, someone who has a bunch of books. Um, so I've done that with DeLillo and McCarthy and Toni Morrison and Carson. And uh, I started reading Le Guin's books and, and not ended in chronicle order, but just as many as I could. Um, the year she passed away. So I was in the middle of maybe my third or fourth book when she, when she passed. And I ended up reading 25 of her books that year, maybe out of, out of the rest of the readings doing just tons and tons. And uh, Appleseed wouldn't be what it is without her example, both in the way of writing a novel of ideas, the way she writes dialogue, the way her conversations progress an idea or that what's in competition is like, is, is idea in some way, as opposed to sort of other kinds of conflict. Um, and I also think like her work as a utopianist in the way that she, she really did believe there was a way we could, be, we could be better, we could live a better world, if we could imagine a better world. Um, one of the things I think about a lot is from a, an essay of hers called uh, uh, Utopia and Utopia Yang. And, and in that really briefly, she says, uh, inside every utopia is a dystopia and inside every dystopia is a utopia. And the way that to read a dystopia is to imagine how it could be different and to read a utopia is to imagine why we don't live in that. And, and I think about that a lot in doing the kind of like future, imagined futures writing that I've done in, in this novel. Um, to imagine how things could be better is, is part of it. And to see what could go wrong is also to ask us to think how we could not, how we could avoid that. Um, I don't know, she, I could talk about maybe like when for too long and, and maybe I already have, but, uh, but yeah, very close to my heart. Someone I go back to all the time. And I, I really think about almost every day at the writing desk now. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for that question. It's super important. I'm glad you could detect that in one question. In one, it was the first question asked. We were in the first five minutes of this. Someone was like, oh, the Le Guin guy. Yes, the Le Guin guy. Have to do that. It's good. So that I think this was for you, Julie. Did John Ruskin influence mm. you? Does that sound? Oh, I'm like not a... familiar with John Ruskin. I will say that the two books that I, poets that I read while I was writing the book were Emily Dickinson and a poet named Larry Eigner. And I chose these poets very strategically because I felt they supported me in the work that I was doing. Uh, Larry Eigner spent most of his life living at home uh, with his parents. Uh, he had cerebral palsy and would write poems on a typewriter. 
mm-hmm. and would look out the window and write poems every day, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poems. Um, I, I brought, I bought one of his books and it was one of the most expensive books I've ever bought. <laughs> Yay, was, poets getting, an, having an expensive book. I love it. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Money that I did not have, but I spent $300 on one volume mm-hmm. because the way he, he formatted his poems on a typewriter, the, um, publishers wanted to preserve that. And it was so beautiful because wow. he wrote multiple poems and the way he spaced the poems and how they're lineated and the way it's like listening to a symphony. He writes about nature like it's music. And Dickinson does something similar too with her, with her lyric, uh, with her lyric ear. And so I saw like these poets has like, not living in complete isolation because they were both actually pretty social people. People have an idea about Emily Dickinson, like she had no social life. She was writing letters. She had, she had her um, um, sister-in-law, of you know, like a few miles from her. She wasn't like in a room under a blanket <laughs> all day. Mm-hmm. And the same is true for Larry Eichner. Uh, he was housebound, but he moved to San Francisco and he had a lot of friends and. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not sure why I'm talking about No, 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 I love it. Well, well, also, did you say, did I hear you correctly that you, you exclusively read them while you were working on this? So you weren't reading anyone else. You were immersing yourself in these two poets. I think that is really cool. I, I, I like the idea of that. It was fun. Yeah. Um, I think you have sold a few of Larry's $300 books through (laughs) (laughs) talking about it. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that. David, what about you? Are there, is there a writer who's really influenced you when you think about writing about nature? Well, John Graves, Goodbye to a River. Mm -hmm. One of the great river books and courses, which has been in print since 1959. And, um, Rachel Carson, yeah. Silent Spring. You know, she was a government biologist when she wrote that book. You know, we think she is an author, but she was a government biologist working in the lab studying biology when she wrote the book, kicked off the modern environmental movement. Uh, although Leopold, Ted Campbell, that's a great one. Um, so certainly there are lots of books, and also books that use nature symbols, Glenn Gould, La Rudolfo Knight, which uses the owl and other symbols. As a, a very intricate part of that uh, of that, narrative. so there are a lot of books that are very important to me that that touch on nature in a variety of ways, um, and others, um, artists and um, arts companies, a theatrical company who had an activist theater starting in 1965 that presented the life of the farm worker, you know, with the approval and full support of Cesar Chavez. I mean, those were artists who wrote and presented theater and had something to do with people working the land every day. So there are lots of ways that people have used nature to write either uh, music or to write uh, novels or to um, write poetry, to write essay, a lot of different things. So the things I love about nature is it focuses in so many ways, ways that we wouldn't anticipate. And I think that's one of the beauties of nature is it's so important for us to be surrounded by it and be influenced by it. And when we separate ourselves from it, it's a loss to us. We need to be present to it. And I would like to remind everybody that every day, the birds you see are doing their work. The trees that you see are converting uh, sunlight into energy, carbon dioxide into oxygen. They're home to a hundred species of plants and animals and birds every day, all the time. They are doing their work. So my question for the writers listening tonight is, or one hours, nature is giving to us at every moment that we're alive. The natural world is contributing to our lives. So how are we contributing to their lives? And we need to remember also that we're a part of nature. We often think of ourselves as separate from it. We're the two-legged species. We're the most invasive species of all. And we have to find ways to interact with what we take from nature other people. And I would encourage all the writers to not remember that we might think we know what our work is about, 
you know, I wrote a book about rivers and hope and social justice. I got a call from a woman who, um, whose husband was quarantined during the pandemic because he has cancer. He was strictly quarantined. You give up hope. And he had to go back to the hospital. She took my book and read it to him last twice in the hospital. And he restored his hope. The doctors had more time to find a cure. Now he's better now in the hospital. And you know, when we write something, we think we know what it's about. And yet something comes to you because one of your life to your work, just as we go to nature and discover things we might not anticipate, people will come to your work and they will discover things that they did not anticipate and that you did not. So I think that's important for us to remember as writers is we're working in nature. Nature is working on us and with us. So we will collaborate with nature. It will be our greatest collaborator. We need our editors, we need our publishers, illustrators, people design the books, do the cover design. But the greatest influence us, for us as writers can be nature because it's right there all the time. Yeah. It's doing its job, are we? Yeah. Nature can be our biggest influence as writers. It's doing its job. Are we doing our job? I love it. I think that's a great sentiment um, to end this conversation on. I want to say again that I feel so lucky to have had the chance to talk to each of you, but also to have just had the chance to sit with and spend time with your books over the last few weeks. And I want to, Matt, you get to hold up. Um, <laughs> Apple seed. I'll do it. Uh, and I will hold up our other two books, but also Sam will once again, drop in the, um, chat box. I know the link. So I would encourage you, whether you follow our link to book people where you can find all three of these books, um, or go to deep vellum's website, where I know you can get Julie's book now and David's book. Now you can get David's book on book people. Now pre-order Matt's book. Go to an independent bookstore if you're able to, whatever you can do to support our indie bookstores and then also support our wonderful writers who joined us here tonight. So a big thank you to everyone who listened in, who um, who spent some time with us this evening and a really big thank you to our three panelists. Thank you so much for being here and uh, have a great evening, everyone. Go, you know what? Whatever time it is, just walk outside. Just get <laughs> off your computer turn off the zoom and walk outside and then do it again tomorrow and the day after. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Becca. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Thank Becca. you. Thank Bye you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>